Hello again, we are now into week three for Busy 1071 Online. This will be our content lecture for week three. And as we are wrapping up this content in week three, we are approaching a 10% mini test that will cover all of the material. Well, not all of the material, but it will cover material that was delivered from weeks one through three. And there could be questions from the 13 Actions textbook, which is pretty much more like an article, it's so short. I'm assuming you guys have read that by now. It probably would have taken you about half an hour. Um, there'll be a few questions from that on some of the, the worthwhile suggestions that the author provides. Um, and there will also be questions taken directly from my notes and my lectures. So when I say that, I mean that in my lectures, in the audio in my lectures, I will be discussing things and some of that stuff may come up on the mini test, but it's, believe me guys, I'm, I'm going to be very fair. I know a lot of the factual information about the real estate industry is new to you and unique. So I'm, I'm going to be pretty fair about the stuff that I, I question. Uh, the majority of it will be in the notes, but some of the stuff will be mentioned in the videos as well. Um, and the bulk of it will be from weeks one and two. This week three uh, content delivery is, there will be a, a few questions from it. Um, but it's more about personal exploration because that's that's one of the biggest things you need to go through before you get into a commission sales career, not necessarily just selling real estate, but any any high demand commission sales career with crazy up and down hours. You're going 100 miles an hour. Everything's great. You got 10 deals on the go. Three weeks later, nobody's calling you. You have nothing going on. There's, there's a lot of uh, volatility in a commission sales career. And there are also a lot of demands in a commission sales career because as a commission sales representative, whether it's real estate or another industry, you are an entrepreneur. You are in charge of your own business. You're the boss. You're your own boss. So you need to be um, a master of many trades beyond most professions that you could think of. And when it comes to commission sales in real estate, that could not be even more true. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to encourage you guys to explore the types of skills you have, the types of people you are as students in my online course, as people in a relationship with your significant others, as people at the jobs you've had so far, and think about the skills you have. Think about where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, some things you might do to make things better. We're going to talk about all that stuff today, and it's not going to be a very long lecture because a big part of this is going to be sending you off to kind of work on this and then come back into the lecture and see where you think you line up based on the level of these skills that I'm going to tell you you're going to need. So without further ado, let's jump into this week three content. Uh, once again, these PowerPoint slides that I use to speak to as most of what I'm doing is really just podcasting. Um, I've been meaning to say that as I've been making these lectures and I forgot to mention that in week one. I'm, I'm not trying to do big, engaging, animated lectures. I'm doing speeches. I'm doing podcasting to help you relate to the material and the information that I'm trying to teach to you. So uh, the slides will always be available for you in FOL every week when we have a video lecture if you want to work alongside them and add notes, which wouldn't be the worst idea. Uh, but like I said, the quiz, uh, the, the FOL quiz that will be our 10% mini test, which I will launch the details of um, every semester based on the timing we're having. So sometimes you might take it by the end of week three, sometimes you might not take it for a couple weeks later. It depends on how we launched and what the enrollment was like. So here um, we are in week three, we're talking about the professional real estate toolbox. And what I mean by that is, holy cow, do you have to know a lot of stuff about a lot of things. We will also discuss, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the general demographics of realtor realtors. So as we get into the toolbox, then we're gonna that leads nicely into well, who are these people that are realtors? Who are the successful ones? And in week one, we had that article uh, showing the top realtors in Canada. You might want to go back to FOL content and revisit that, and you will see that a lot of the things we're going to talk about today. Were, are mentioned in those biographies, uh, those profiles of those top 100 realtors in the country. It's pretty interesting how that stuff lines up. And you don't have to be a top realtor to know this. I'm a realtor that's that's done a lot of stuff in various uh, 
mediums of real estate sales, I guess I would say. So I've done tons of residential, but I've also done a fair amount of commercial. I've done leasing, I've done commercial leasing, I've done business sales. And after doing a lot of different things, then I realize where my focus should be and I try and focus there as I talked a lot about in the week two lecture. So here we go. <laughs> Do not freak out, okay? Required skills for realtors, and I am not kidding. This is an abridged list just providing probably the most important things. And you're going to find once you become a real estate salesperson, once you become licensed and start to operate in the business, in the industry, there's all sorts of stuff that you do not know. And it will come to you as you encounter it. But what it starts with are fundamentals, okay? And I've, I've used that word a lot in many of my lectures to you so far already, fundamentals, okay? So these are fundamental skills, either interpersonal, like people skills, or business and marketing skills that you pretty much need to have even before you go and get licensed. Well, knowledge of the local market, how am I get? I could bring you like a, a pile of people from every small town I've been to that are literally watching the real estate market like a hawk, like they're just all over everything. So I'm going to um, walk you through these to some degree with very brief explanations and then I'm going to use examples after we get to the next slide. So. Let's just define these in their most basic format. Uh, honesty and integrity. So honesty has to do more with uh, telling the truth, like not uh, withholding certain factual information, just being truthful. That's what honesty is about. Where integrity is more about doing what the right thing is to do, morally speaking. And these things definitely run hand in hand. And whenever you're in a sales commission industry, uh, sales commission career, especially real estate, you're going to run into situations where things might go better if you don't, don't tell somebody about something. Well, I don't know if there's ever been water in the basement. I don't think so. When you know darn well there has been. First of all, that is against your, um, when you become a licensed realtor, that is against your, your responsibilities to clients and customer buyers. And there's a difference between the two that we'll get into later in the course. But, well, I can get into it now. Clients, you're in a contract with them. You owe them the highest level of information that you can possibly provide. Customers are people you're working with that might be on the other end of a deal. Maybe you're not in a contract with them. You still owe them the truth. You just don't have to tell them everything. But there are certain things you're required to tell them. So there are defects in homes Material defects would be the ones you know about versus latent defects. I'm not going to put that on your mini test. Material defects, if you're aware of them, you have to tell everybody that no matter what. This house used to be a grow up. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, it was. I'm sorry. I should have told you that. I almost forgot. Right? You don't want to forget things like that because you, you lose your license for not telling people like that, things like that. Um, so just I, I'm, I'm kind of going off the rails there a little bit on the honesty thing. Just tell people the truth. Okay? Integrity. Do what you feel is right, all right? If, if multiple people are after the same property and there's several different ways to handle a situation like that when you have multiple offers, and, and now it's, it's heavily regulated the way that's done, but if they all come to you directly in a small town and it's, it's not a huge city deal with a ton of offers, you could definitely favor one party over another and there are ways not to do that. So that would be more about doing the right thing, right? So tell the truth, do the right thing. Be empathetic. So put yourself in other people's shoes. Understand that it's not all about you. And when you're in commission sales and you're you're basically a relationship marketer, okay, you have to be able to do that, which ties right into being able to listen. Don't just talk, 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 tell people what they want to hear, blah, 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 blah. You need to stop and really interpret what people are saying to you. You need to be flexible when it comes to scheduling. You need to know yourself well. You need to be very adaptable. That's not scheduling flexibility. That's saying, wow, I'm really bad at math. Okay, I, 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 I don't really know what to do with uh, this certain technology. And it, you need to learn it or you're not going to be competing with your colleagues that have already figured this stuff out. Okay, and this is not necessarily empathetic, but knowing the client situation. Are they residents of Canada? Are they non-residents? That's that those have huge tax implications. So, and this all comes back to listening well and asking them questions. 
Get back to people fast. The, the longer you wait, the sooner somebody else is going to get back to them. Straightforward pricing. Um, this, don't give people a price just to get a listing. Okay, be straight with people. Tell them what you really think you're going to get. There's a lot of realtors and sales reps that do that just to get listings and then they never end up selling them. It ends up being worse than if they never had the listing at all because you don't look good if you have a listing that you can't sell. Okay, it looks good to have a bunch of listings, but not if they've been sitting there for months. So I put this under interpersonal because even though that's more of a market analysis type of thing and I'm trying to line up on each side the type of business skill that would set up with the interpersonal skill on the left side. This is my information, by the way. I don't take this stuff from books. This is what I've experienced as a higher level real estate salesperson over the last five years and being in the business for over a decade. Um, you got to be on top of this stuff. And if you go in saying, oh yeah, maybe I could get that. And they're telling you, this is what we have to get because our house is worth this. And you don't have the guts <laughs> to say, sorry, but as much as I really adore your home and you've done such a great job with it, the market economics just aren't there. You can't just tell people yours is worth that much. You can't make your own economy up. Lots of people want to do that. Okay. And those are the, the houses that usually end up being listed without real estate salespeople because nobody will take the listings because their prices are so high. So if you take a listing like that, you are not having good integrity. You are not, well, knowing their situation as well as you should because maybe they're reaching on the price because there's something else going on that they have to they haven't told you about right understanding family needs this can wow this can run into a lot of these like scheduling and being able to listen to people understanding that that uh, mothers and fathers of, of young children have very demanding schedules and and just living within a home they might have certain layouts that they need to have because one of their children um, has you know maybe a terminal illness or something and and the other ones don't and you need to keep these things separated there's all kinds of things that and without making it seem like you're trying to you know break down privacy barriers and, and kind of pry into their private personal life you still need to figure that stuff out understanding their personal finances not yours theirs okay and just overall with all these things just being sensitive to the people on the other side. So most of this, as I was going through and talking about it, I had in my head the idea of, of kind of getting to know a buyer and sellers too. But let's say you have a buyer and you're going around to all these different houses and you want a certain listing that, that's available to fit right into your schedule and you get really frustrated with the other realtor or the owner because they won't let you see it right at that time when in the background, they haven't told you this, they just had a death in the family or they haven't cleaned their house for two weeks because one of their kids has been sick or their pet just had a explosive diarrhea in the living room. I've seen it before, trust me. Uh, so you need to be sensitive to them too. And if, if they're telling you, listen, our house is gonna look awesome. If you could just show it tomorrow and give us one more day, that would really help us. It, everything here is about understanding situations with people and being really flexible and really empathetic. I mean, that's so if we switch to the other side, and I, like I said, this is a podcast. I'm spending a lot of time on this one slide, but these are the kind of things that can help you with the interpersonal skills, honesty and integrity. Anytime you're communicating orally or written, make sure that you're doing this in a way where it's not twisting the truth. It's not mistakenly giving them the wrong idea where it's done professionally without grammar errors and incomplete sentences like this. You need to be a good business writer. Period. Oh, I'm selling real estate. What do I need to write? In our local real estate board, the London St. Thomas board, we get 1,000 characters to tell people all about the listing. And the analytical data from realtor.ca shows that more people look and read, look at and read the description before they even go into the rest of the photos. Because if they don't like what's going on with the description, if it's not the right fit for them in terms of a house, they're gone. They bounce, right? So that 1,000 characters has to be pristine, it has to be perfect. I will spend six hours on a description alone, just for, for well, in the summertime more when I'm not full-time at the college and I'm off for a couple months, but you you really need to be on top of your writing. Um, this doesn't really line up as well with that thing on the left, but knowledge of the local market, we talked about that a ton last week. You know what that's all about. 
if you don't know and understand, like let's say you're, you're going to a listing presentation and you're trying to talk some owners into selling their house, they've invited you out. You get there and they ask you about two other places on that same street that have just sold that year and you don't know anything about it. Okay, it takes a little bit of time to do that homework. You need to be on top of that stuff. You need to understand industry and processes. Let's talk about HST, the harmonized sales tax in Ontario. What a wonderful, beautiful thing it is uh, taxing us at 13%. And I know it could be worse. Um, I was talking to some of my students. I think they were from, where? Oh, where was it? Their, their sales tax is 18%. It can be worse, So, but it's still pretty bad. And there are situations in real estate when HST is applicable. And 90% of realtors don't even know when the heck that is. Um, there's some simple ways to look at it. It's, it's, it's applicable on a brand new house that's never been lived in because it's technically a brand new product. Somebody buys that, they live in it for three months, they go and resell it, no HST anymore. I know that might seem kind of strange that there's not really much of a time limit, but there isn't. Anything commercial has HST on it. It is applicable. But if a property is zoned commercial, but it's never been used commercially, it's all about the use, then there is no HST because it's still just a residential house that happened to pick up some commercial zoning when a municipality or a town redid their zoning bylaws. It's, this is the kind of stuff we talk about later in the course, but you see what just happened there? I just went on for like a minute and a half about all this stuff, and you guys are probably like, what the heck? You need to be that person. You need to sit down with somebody and explain to them things that they don't even know about because it might affect the sale of their property or purchasing a home in the same way. So knowledge of industry and processes. Actually, you know what? Here, I will show you an example of this. Uh, there are so many resources out there at your fingertips. You don't even have to be a licensed realtor to have access to this. So in the area where I mainly operate, in the Grand Bend area, this is in a municipality called Lambton Shores. So if I search Lambton Shores zoning, okay, you are going to find that on a website, I'm also going to search Lambton Shores GIS. Okay, this is free stuff. Okay, here's their entire zoning bylaw. It describes every different zoning and what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do in that zoning, how it works, all that kind of stuff, okay? So here's just Grand Bend. This is a map that shows you each property. And if you get to know a town fairly well, you could figure it out. Like, so I, here, I'll show you where my house is, um, or the one we just built. I'll show you where my current, my new house is. So we are in this subdivision here, in Huron Woods. And my lot where I built my house is right here, right here, okay? That's it, right there. Okay, there's Lake Huron, there's the beach. We're nice and close to the beach, it's great. So in this whole block here, uh, it identifies that this is R6 zoning. This does not take a long time to do, right? So then I connect that R6 zoning with the actual zoning bylaw itself, which is linked up here, again, for free. Like, this is not hard to do. You just go in and get this stuff. Uh, I go in here, I search R6. How many instances of it could there really be before I get to the page that describes for me in detail. Wow, there's a lot of R6, actually. Uh, here we go, R6. There we go. It tells me how big the lot has to be if I'm forming a new lot. So there are lots of lots that are already made with R6 zoning that are less than this in terms of square meters, but they were made before this zoning bylaw was enacted to require them to be that large. So that, that's called legal non-conforming. Uh, this is how far it has to be from the front yard. That's the minimum frontage a lot must have. Uh, that's how side, side yards, if it's a corner lot, how much the building can cover. So there's all this, and then there's all these exceptions. Like, this is not something you have to make a phone call to Lambton Shores and wait three days for them to call you back to get. All of this stuff is online. That GIS system I showed you, this is really cool. So this will actually show the footprint of the building that's already on the property, um, which is quite neat. And it gives you pretty strong satellite imagery as well that's even better than Google Earth, but it's even though it's using Google Earth. 
Um, so if I go in here and I wanna look for my same property. So now I know the area pretty well, so I can do this quite quickly, but there's Huron Woods, okay? There's my house, which is uh, not there yet. Okay, see this? Even though the house is built, because my building permit has not been closed 100% yet. So this, is, so it will, it will take a year before this shows up in the GIS system, but it's pretty neat. And you can actually, here, um, let's go back. Let's get out of geology uh, layers. 2015 aerial and take off the topo map. 2010 aerial. So there's my lot, nice and uh, blank. 2006, so this is really good to show the beach area and how it changes, watch this. Look how small that beach got in 2015 versus 2010, it was pretty big. 2006, it was just huge and it wasn't covered in grass. Now there's no beach. Um, that's just nature, it happens, right? And you can see the, um, the improvement of the, uh, the equipment as the years went on and the different times that it took it and stuff like that. It's really cool. All of this, okay, I went on this whole thing just to show you guys that out there, if you want knowledge of the industry, knowledge of processes, knowledge of your local market, so these three things here, most of that stuff is free. You don't need to go to class for that. It's all out there. You just have to do a little bit of research. And that's almost every municipality has one of those GIS systems. It's great. Um, time management, like if you're in the middle of a lecture and you take off for five minutes and start showing people satellite imagery, that might not have been the best use of time. I'm kidding. I think that was kind of valuable for you guys, but you need to be able to do things efficiently. You need to be able to know when to put some things off, okay? Um, negotiation tactics for, for sure, and there's the whole nature versus nurture thing. We're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get into the work-life balance. In fact, I have some stuff in week five uh, specifically on that, um, that you're not, most of you are not born salespeople, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. That doesn't mean you can't learn it. You just got to have it when you start negotiating. Uh, photo and video work. I, the stuff I've done with YouTube is insane. And the videos that I make, uh, obviously I'm good at voiceover audio and, and doing these lecture videos, but the stuff I do in real estate is much more animated. There's drone footage. I don't fly drones. I don't have the pilot's license to do that, but I know who to hire to do that. I do have a good camera. So you just, you need to at least have knowledge of it, even if you're not gonna do it yourself. Uh, search engine optimization and social media optimization. If you are a real estate salesperson, you need to have strong skills in this area, strong enough to know who to hire to do it, at least if you don't have time to do it yourself. Cutting edge digital marketing plans. That is what has made my business in Grand Bend because I was doing it before anybody else was and I'm still the only one doing these narrated story type videos. You really wanna tell a story, right? You need to tell the story uh, of a property and, and sometimes there's legacy value there or people actually want a property just because of its history. That's very rare, but uh, experience uh, with economic analysis. Um, so, uh, not experience economic analysis, experience with economic analysis. Uh, also really important because everything about pricing is about what has sold. Not what all these crazy people are listing for, but what people are willing to pay. And as you analyze that, there's all these different factors. How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? How big was the frontage? How, how, what was the square area? Was it on the water? Was it not on the water? Is it private? What's it like? What's the, what's the topography like? There's just a million factors that are, that are involved in placing evaluation on a property before you even get to the house even. And that's so knowledge of homes and construction. Uh, this is important. You don't have to be a builder to start to learn about this stuff. You can just watch Mike Holmes for a few seasons and learn a little bit, but don't believe everything you see on TV, though. Be careful with that. Um, knowledge of mortgages and finance, for sure. You don't have to be a mortgage broker. You need to know some good ones to send them to, but you need to understand the basics of it. You need to understand that three years ago, it was a lot easier for somebody who's self-employed to get a mortgage based on their stated income than it is now. Th those people can barely get mortgages now, even though they make just as much as anybody else because they're always in their taxes trying to make it look like they make less. And then they go to get a mortgage and that backfires on them big time. It's, and generally speaking, the lenders, the banks, 
they look at being self-employed as being unstable. So they just don't even support people who run their own business. It's difficult. Home staging, creativity, design, it just doesn't stop, okay? So lots of examples, lots of talk about what all this stuff is. Here's the big question, okay? Where do you stand with a list like that? So go back to that list, okay, print it out, email it, do whatever you wanna do. I want you to stop the video now, whenever you're watching this, beginning of week three, end of week three, I want you to take a little bit of time, send this to your parents, send this to close friends, and just say, hey, can you take five minutes and highlight in this list the things that you think I really rock at? Like, what am I really good at? Is there anything in this list that you would think, oh, that's their thing? Because that's the kind of stuff you wanna do before you, be, get, before you start selling real estate so you know certain things you can focus on. Also ask them, also ask them, what do I really suck at, <laughs> okay? And if you suck at telling the truth, you better fix that before you get into real estate, all right? so. This is one of those weeks I really love because people always look at stuff like this and they say, oh, that's a bunch of common sense. I don't have to learn about that before I become a sales representative in real estate. Uh, really? These are the things that the books don't tell you, okay? That list that I showed you, it's not scratching the surface. That's a pretty comprehensive list, but it's not showing you everything. But these are the things that are a pretty big deal, okay, in today's world of selling real estate. And if you're looking at this list and you're thinking, especially on the interpersonal side, because that's 90% of the battle is developing the relationship and keeping good connections with people. Then you get to show off all this stuff on the right side. I should have probably said that at the beginning, but that's that's the case here. So if you're looking at this side going, wow, I'm just, I just not any good with dealing with people, you better start working on that if you wanna get into sales because that is gonna make or break your business. So send that list to some people and say, hey, do me a favor, parents, friends, where do I stand here? Pick the top three things I'm bad at and the top three things I'm good at and just let me know where I stand, okay? Stop the video, pick back up in this spot later. Okay, hopefully all of you did what I just asked you to do uh, because now I'm gonna share with you what the results were when I showed that list to my wife. And what I asked her to do was I just, I didn't give her like do three and three, I just said, Tell me which ones you think I need to work on and I'll put them in red and tell me which ones you think like I really stand out in these areas and I'll put them in green because she she did provide me with some commentary. She's like, I we worked with realtors before you were a realtor. I have friends that are realtors. She does and they all I'm usually getting all their business too. Um, it, there's that's generally because of my overall knowledge of business and just marketing and and being good with analyzing things. So anything that's just left in black, it was I wasn't bad at it, it's just kind of a given with me that I'm automatically like, I'm empathetic because I'm always asking client stuff. I never mess with, play games with pricing, I understand families, I'm, I'm good with just processes with owners, knowledge, of, these are kind of automatic. The things that really stuck out to her, I'll start with the positive, and she's actually heard people say this to me on the phone. She said, I've, I've heard people say to you, well, we decided, why did I make that one green? We decided to work with you, Mike, because you were straight up with us about some of these houses and we've worked with other realtors that would have told us to just buy it. And it would have made your life easier because then you wouldn't have had to keep showing us stuff. But in the long run, it worked out better for me because they worked with me. So I'm honest, I have integrity. I'm always looking to do the right thing. People help me out. I always help them out back. I'm, I'm upfront about everything. She said, that's a really good thing about me. I have quite a flair for writing, and when I'm really on it, uh, I, I can be pretty good with oral communication as well. Um, my digital marketing experience, I have a master's in digital media. Nobody can touch that here where I work in Grand Bend. It, it's, it definitely makes me stand out. This stuff for sure, but I pay people to do that now, and so do most of my colleagues. So it's these little things that make me stand out. I put these spreadsheets together. Here, let me just show you one. I'm sitting down and doing this. It takes a long time. My clients really appreciate this, okay? that's This is not normal analysis for realtors. So my wife said, I've seen the stuff you do. That really stands out. She's just like, the rest of that stuff, it's all black. You're just, you're good there. And then over here on the right side, she's like, yeah, you get, I'm always late. I'm, oh, well, this came up, that came up. I'm not late for class, but I mean, I, I allow uh, buyers, particularly more so than sellers, 
to take over my schedule. I just, and I, I shouldn't allow it. I need to be more on top of stuff. I'm a, I'm definitely a type A. I, I don't do well with uh, scheduling programs and CRM software. I just, I'm all over the place, but somehow I'm still selling a lot because of these other things that are green. Um, at the same, in the, in the same way, I understand economic analysis. I, I'm also pretty good at helping people to kind of come up with ways to, to make things work within financial constraints. And, I, and I'm sympathetic toward them, not necessarily empathetic, but I, I, I uh, not because I make so much money. It's not that I, I'm not, uh, it's sympathy because I'm, I was there and I was, I was a first time home buyer. Everybody has been at one point before they buy their first home. It's just, I'm not anymore, right? Um, so uh, the black ones are good, the red ones. Um, <laughs> I, I tend to talk a lot and I've been working on this really hard. This might be more so in my family relationship where I'm just always dominating the conversation and stuff, but she did say I could work on my listening ability a little bit. Maybe be more, this is weird because I, I, I allow uh, clients to hijack my schedule, but she said my schedule is not very flexible. And I think what she meant is that that's a work-life balance thing, that I'm all work and my kids are missing me and it's just not great. So we're going to talk about that after week three. Uh, that's a whole section of the course we're going to talk about. Uh, she doesn't think I know myself very well because I tend to get worked up about the silliest things and the worst crap ever happens and I'm like totally handling it fine. She's like, it's it's like backwards. It doesn't make any sense, which is another reason she says I'm not very adaptable, that I I can't deal with routine, but when stuff changes, I'm, this is what she says. I, I, I agree with most of this. I do live with this woman. Um, she's the love of my life. I'm not upset about this. I just, uh, hmm. <laughs> So I'm the professor of this course, and I feel like I'm finding out things about me that I didn't think were true. And I said, oh, you're just talking about you and me. And she goes, no, I listen to half your phone calls when you're in the car and we're driving somewhere. I'm talking about you and your clients. But because of the green ones, she said, I don't think they're ever going to leave you, especially because of this stuff, my sellers. Like I have builder clients now that... I have two of them that worked with five or six realtors before me and now they've been with me for four years and they're not going anywhere. And I sell stuff for them from Grand Bend over to St. Thomas all the way to Kitchener-Waterloo. Uh, it's, it's great. That, that gets a little hairy uh, because you that's another thing we talked about, knowing your local market, trying to stick to a local area. Uh, when I'm selling, uh, usually if it's in a city market, I'm not gonna have buyers in KW anyway. I don't get a lot of direct calls and when I do, I might just refer them to a colleague in the area so I don't have to drive there. But that's how mine turned out. Uh, but you need to understand that this is a basic list of the fundamental important ones that I believe have affected my career negatively and positively, of course, when I haven't done the best job with them. Uh, it's a negative when I'm doing it better. It's a positive. It, it, but this is, this is what my career has been about. And that's not a small list, people. So um, on top of this, and this is a funny one, and I kind of, I, I did this with my wife a little bit too. Uh, let's jump back into the slides here. We're almost done, actually. This isn't a very long lecture compared to the last one because I send you off to do a bit of thinking about it. Um, but these are some things that people might ask you to do. Okay, so you have to be comfortable or working on all of the things in that table we just went over but you might still, beyond that, be asked to wear another hat. For example, a babysitter, a pet sitter. Okay, I, I've done showings where I've lost a kid, where the, the, the owners of the building, this was a commercial showing, they wanted to take the buyers through. My clients, who I've been working with for a little while, said, you know, can, can you stay with Delaney? And I was like, I, yeah, I don't know, I guess. Uh, and then she's off running around. She gets playing hide and seek. She knows me. I'm, I'm, she's one of my... Uh, my daughter's friends. So she knew who I was. So she was comfortable with me. I couldn't find her. And they're just off doing their showing and they're totally fine. I told them I can't find Delaney. They didn't even, they were like totally fine with it. Like, oh, she does that all the time. I was freaking out. I got three kids of my own. I don't lose my kids. This kid just took off. So I was a little uncomfortable with that. But hey, you know what? I'm a licensed real estate sales representative. I got to deal with it. 
pet sitters, don't let the cat out, don't let the cat in, don't put the dog here, don't put the dog, the constant with stuff with pets. They want you to go and clean their yard, mow the lawn, landscaping. You wouldn't believe the stuff you include for a full commission listing. Um, clean the house, put the cushions out, put the cushions back, just all these little examples I'll be giving you along the way. Um, a secretary, I have had clients that start calling me after I do a deal with them and like, like a week later, a couple weeks later, hey, I'm shopping around for a good plumber. Can you make some recommendations? Sure, try this guy. They call me right back. Well, that doesn't work. Can you find somebody to do this work for me? Here's a description of the work. Here's what needs to be done. Here are some possible dates. Start calling around and find me a good plumber. It's like, wait a minute. Hang on. I don't work for you. <laughs> I just got you a killer deal on a property and you are really happy with me. If you want me to start working for you, <laughs> you have to start paying me money on the side. Like, and I would never ask for that, so I usually just tell them, I'm really sorry, but I, I, I'm, I'm busy working with clients trying to do for them the same thing I just did for you. Like, are you happy with what you got? Oh, yes, Mike, I'm really happy. Well, okay, then try this one more guy, but after that, I, I don't know what to say. Like, it's, it's difficult. I've had this guy the last couple months, it's been happening, and it's, uh, they call you up because they don't know how to GPS a phone, so that's another good one. Not the same as a secretary, but you set up a bunch of listings for somebody and they're calling you in between every one because you're not driving in the same car asking you how to get there. It's just, it's a lot of extra stuff. I've been asked to be a translator even though I only speak English. Uh, that one was interesting. Um, I, did, I was able to do it with Google. Uh, I, I had to fix a set of stairs on a lakefront listing this spring. She asked me to shop around for a contractor and you know what, I'm, I know I just said I don't wanna be a secretary but for a lakefront listing at, at almost two million bucks, I was willing to do that. But nobody, we're in a small town. None of them can do it. They don't have any time. There's no work. So I went over there. I, I just said, listen, does it have to be pretty or do you just want it to be safe? She's like, just make it safe. So I went over there with some tools and I just fixed it myself. I mean, you got to have a toolbox literally. So there you go. Uh, this was an interesting one and I will never tell you who it was because, well, you would never know them anyway. Um, but hopefully they never watch this video because they'll know who they were if they watch this video. I was asked literally to download separation agreements so they could look at some separation agreements and kind of pick one so that they could provide to the mortgage broker a separation agreement basically drafted up and sorted out by their realtor, not a lawyer, okay? Not someone who's made to do these things or who's learned to do these things, but the realtor. And it, there's nothing illegal about that. I just, you know, sometimes realtors will go above and beyond for certain deals and it does affect you in the long run. They will tell people, well, Mike Sloan, he, he went above and beyond for us. He, he truly understood our situation and we wanted to keep it private and he helped us out with something and that's the kind of thing he'll do for all his clients. Like he will go above and beyond. So that's why I do things like that. But I wouldn't do that again. That was really awkward because uh, I'm friends with both of them. And they were actually separating. They weren't, just to clarify, we were not trying to pull a mortgage scam because that's why people do do that stuff. They, they try and make it seem like they're separated so they can get a separate mortgage. And then when they sell the one property, they don't have to pay capital gains tax because it's their primary residence. All stuff for later on in the course, okay? We're gonna learn a lot of those tax tricks and stuff that you should and should not do. Uh, mind reader, that's another good one. Well, how could you not know that we were interested in that house? Um, because you didn't tell me. After we went and saw it, you said, wow, that place sucked, and you never said anything. And they said, well, when it got an offer on it, you should have called us. I said, you told me you hated it. Uh, how would I know that you needed to know when it had an offer on it? This. I've had that exact same conversation with so many people because all the ones they like sold for over asking price and they're all gone. And then somewhere in the mix of it, they decided they did like the crappy one, but they never told me. They just figured I would read their mind and know that. So get ready for it. You're gonna be expected to be a mind reader. Um, I might have mentioned in my uh, personal introduction, I don't think I did. I, I think I mentioned I got into real estate because of student rentals. Uh, but I, I don't think I mentioned that one of the reasons I shifted my business to Grand Bend was not just because I was living up there and that's where I kind of kind of planted my feet once I settled in after I moved away from the States. Uh, and that's where my family's always at a cottage and stuff. I, there's tons of realtors in this little tiny town. So I always thought, oh, I'm not going to go up there and compete with all my friends. I got a good thing going here around Fanshawe College. Of course, 
right when those riots happened, which was not too long ago, 2013, I think it was, 2015, 2014, I don't know. It was long enough ago that I don't want to think about it anymore because I had seven listings on those student rental streets around the college where that massive Project X situation occurred. And I was being called not only by the owners of the listings I had, but the tenants asking me what to do, asking me to come help and deal with this. And I'm like, I'm the realtor. Like, well, they ripped your sign out and threw it on the roof. So you're probably going to want to come over here and help us out. I'm like, no way in heck I'm coming over there <laughs> doing anything like that. So I was asked to be part of the riot police. Uh, animal control, not the same as, thing as a pet sitter. I have walked into attics and stared raccoons straight in the face, and it ain't fun. And then I've, I've been asked to call Pest Away and help them deal with this. It's just, you truly will wear many, many hats. The list goes on and on. Pause the video now, do some Googling. You'd be shocked at the things realtors have been asked to do. It's pretty funny. Um, so wrapping things up here, now that we understand that a licensed real estate professional, real estate sales representative, a realtor, has to be good at a whole ton of stuff. Who are these people that are realtors? What are their ages? So here's an infographic uh, from the Real Estate Council of Ontario. They only do these every five years or so and they're, they're hard to dig up. Um, this is still pretty similar. I actually called them and asked them. They said, yeah, it's still pretty much the same. It's just we have a lot more realtors now. So after that big boom in 2016, all these people went and got their licenses. Um, but this shows you, if you stop the video and take a look at this in the slides that I have available on FOL, the infographic kind of speaks for itself, okay? A uh, little more male-based profession here in Ontario. Um, we have about 60,000, or had 60,000 back in 2012. Now we're well over, we're over 100. Um, I think I mentioned in my week one video, we're, we're at a quarter of a million realtors in Canada. It's, it's crazy. Uh, but millions, like two million in the States. It's just nuts. Um, so, and this this right here shows you the kind of realtors um, it, like that are, that are still in the industry. You don't see a lot of young ones or you didn't in 2012. This shifted a lot, I was told in 2016. They just didn't have a new infographic for me. So this is courtesy of the Real Estate Council of Ontario. Um, pause the video, take a look at that. Uh, take it in. Doesn't get into education too much. I'll get to that in the next slide, but that's kind of gets into some basic demographics and the type of position they hold in real estate. Okay. Okay. On to the next one. Uh, USA, I was able to get a lot more uh, out of our sort of American real estate association over there. 70% uh, are licensed salespeople. There are people in real estate that that are not salespeople at all that are just working privately for builders and stuff like that. But I don't think they were included in the survey. So it's a 70, 30 breakdown between salespeople and brokers. Okay. Brokers is the next level up who can still be selling, but they can also run a brokerage and be getting cuts of all their salespeople's commission. Okay. Different than Canada. If we jump back there, uh, look at the difference. 58% men, 42% women down in the States. Uh, uh, these buyers and sellers are liking their female realtors at 67%. Um, we didn't get much on the age in Ontario, but knowing that most realtors get into it uh, later on, not when they're younger, probably in their late 30s or 40s, and most of them have been into it for at least 10 years, similar age bracket, like mid 50s. Uh, the, the predominance in Ontario was 10 years on the job, in the States it's eight. Uh, these guys average are working about 35 hours a week. Um, that's not bad. It should be approaching that even if you're part-time, if you want to make some serious money. And you can do that part-time too. And average in the States, just wait, it's 42000 a year, okay, from realtors that are selling stuff, licensed salespeople. In Ontario, it was over 100000 And that's this, this recent data. And the Toronto and Golden Horseshoe areas, that's all the stuff around Toronto, have on their own made that, like contributed to that dramatically. Um, things are a lot more stable in the States. You do have your expensive markets out in California. We've seen the TV shows, but that's uh, 42 grand now. That's in the 50s somewhere, Canadian. So it's about half as much than realtors are making in Ontario. If you did the average across Canada, excluding Ontario and Vancouver, 
it would probably be closer to the average in the states. It's it's because southwestern Ontario has just exploded in recent years and realtors are just making a killing if they're in that position in the market. You got to have listings. Sellers markets can be very hard for people who don't have listings uh, because you're going to take your buyers to 10 different places and they're just going to keep losing every single one. Ten. Hundreds. Uh, so those are some numbers from the states. You can pause the video and kind of take those in. This comes from the National Association of Realtors. So that's the United States version of CREA, okay? And those are 2019 numbers. Um, and I'll try and update those in, in a year or two. This is kind of interesting. Um, and this again comes from the National Association of Realtors in the States. Uh, they have to be high school grads uh, just like they do in Canada, or they have to have a certificate like an equivalent. But a lot of these uh, real estate professionals have done more than that. So some college or university, 30%. Uh, bachelor's degree or college grad, like certificate, like you'd be you graduate from Western, graduate from Fanshawe, also 30%. So 60% of them did something after high school, okay? Uh, over 10%, 13% have a graduate degree or above or an associate's degree, like further education from college or university. Um, and and then this this little chunk have, have sort of tried that stuff uh, at college, but only 8% of the entire market of these American sales representatives in real estate have done uh, nothing more than high school. So if you think you're just gonna jump in there and, and not have uh, strong discipline and uh, an educational background and just general business skills like that's not going to work but you know what you're in the right place you're at Fanshawe College in the business program Lawrence Kinlan School of Business one of the best schools in the province so hey you guys are already doing that so you're good um, contractor status so I, I've discussed uh, especially in week one we talked about how brokerages employ you that you're mostly employed as an independent contractor, okay? You go out, you run your own hours, you're your own boss, you do what you want, your business is up to you, and you basically pay the brokerage a fee to, to be working with them. Um, same as Canada, pretty much. The, the vast majority are independent sales representatives, independent contractors. 100% uh, commission, no salary, no, no stipends or anything like that. You're basically paying to be a realtor pay to play so that and that is the bulk of the industry like Pulte homes will have licensed real estate salespeople that work for them directly that just get a salary and just sit in a house all day and try and sell stuff that's a small chunk of the industry in the states and it's the same in Canada um, so if you'd like to look up some some more stuff uh, and again I'm not, I don't need to put this in the video just click the link check it out there's lots of interesting information uh, Canada really is just a scaled down version of the states uh people that say canada's like the 51st state that's just a bunch of insulting stuff to canadians i'm american and i never stay that stuff we both have our own culture and we both uh live in our countries respectively but in terms of commerce and business and stuff like that it, our countries are both very very similar except we have few enough people in canada to actually have government funded free health care for the most part and Everybody wonders why the states can't do that. And if you look at the economics of it and how many people are there, there's more people just in the southern portion of the state of California, just in the southern part of that one state, than there are in the entire country of Canada. Um, however, demographic-wise, city-wise, the kind of people, the kind of people that are in this industry, it's very, very similar. So you can look at the data from NAR, the National Association of Realtors, and what we have in Canada is just a scaled down version, except we are more male dominated. And I believe that's just Ontario. Ontario is a, is a heavy um, male presence in real estate. And I do find uh, there are buyers that prefer the female realtors, maybe because they're more detail oriented, but because that bad realtor they've heard of is typically male simply because more realtors are male. Um, so that, that would be a subtle difference. Um, I've also been in touch with the London St. Thomas Real Estate Association about data on who's a realtor, who isn't, that kind of stuff. And they don't let me have this to publish, but I can discuss it in the video. We talked about it a little bit in the first video, and I did publish some of those in my own PowerPoint slides. But the interesting part about that is they, they said male, female, it's almost even in the London St. Thomas board. But they did say they get 
a lot of people, more so than other boards, according to them, that go out, get their license, and they're gone within two years. Almost half the people that get their license are gone within two years. I just find that pretty interesting. So it's just another resource you can go to once you become a licensed salesperson in real estate. You can always contact your local real estate board to find out lots of stuff. And I think I still have it up here, hang on. So here's the London St. Thomas Association of Realtors. You don't find a whole lot of stuff just surfing the site, but if you're a paid member of the board and you go to member login, which I can't show in the video, this is all proprietary stuff. Um, oh, I am logged in. Okay, well, I'm not gonna show anything more than this. Just you have this whole thing, like stats dash, but there's literally a statistics dashboard that breaks it down by municipality within the board, shows you what's selling, how many listings are going up, what the numbers look like compared to other years. It's just. It's pretty useful stuff, um, and they also have information on their members, but they don't publish that here. You have to get, you have to call them in and ask for that. So that's where I got some of that data. Uh, so that's another place you can go. Uh, Canadian Real Estate Association also has lots of good data. You can click each of those links and check it out. They have uh, pretty interesting stuff on the housing market for all of Canada and also Ontario. Uh, finally, getting down to the end here, uh, why? the realtors fail uh we will get more into that in the work-life balance stuff i mean it, and in the articles you're going to review at the at the end of this lecture but number one reason and i don't know why you know i always had a hard time getting my head around this because it's like well how does that the reason you fail is free time people who just quit everything and become a real estate sales representative and then don't have a book of leads right when they start just end up, well, I'm just gonna go help my buddy move that day. I'm just gonna go and pick up some hours at the bar again where I was bartending because business seems slow when what they should be doing is going out and trying to harvest business. But they don't have the proper mentor telling them that. And this is why at the end of the day, the bulk of earnings in the real estate industry for selling for like re licensed salespeople is earned by, you know, like, the smaller amount of realtors. So 90% of realtors, no, so 90%, okay, of realtors. And this, I've seen this in several blogs. I put my source there for it, but I, I've seen this similar. It's It used to be the 80-20, and now it's more like 90-10. People who get into this business, okay, 90% of them earn this just one-tenth of the commission that's actually earned each year in real estate, okay? 5% are picking up you know, the next 20, 4% are picking up the next 30. So um, this very small chunk is like, that's that's 60%, right? Uh, it is the 60% of the commissions, I mean, is earned by, uh, I'm, not, I'm not stating this right. This is this, read the slide, you'll understand what's happening here. Most of the money is made by the least amount of people. That's what the 90-10 rule is, okay? 90% um, of the commission is going to about 10% of the realtors. That's the 90-10 rule, all right? This just breaks it down even more specifically. Um, so does that scare the crap out of you? Well, it shouldn't because you could be somewhere in the 50% and still make a pretty good living, okay? There's realtors that are pulling in seven figures a year in commission year over year, and that, that's not common, okay? There are lots of realtors that make over a hundred grand a year. So if that sounds like a decent profession to you, where you can run your own hours and you can go on vacation and still kind of keep in touch with your clients, I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, so just, and, and just knowing about how often people fail, there's gotta be a lot of information on there, uh, out on the web about why they fail. So I picked two of my favorite articles from the last year and I, I, I looked at a lot of them. And I'd like you guys to go now and just take a look at those. We're wrapping up this uh, content lecture now. I think it turned out a little longer than the first one, even though I didn't mean it to. But this is important stuff. Like understanding your life and understanding yourself is very important. And most of these lectures are designed to take about two hours with the stopping and the going and the things I'm asking you to do while you're in the lecture. And then you'll typically have an activity. So this is about right to be an hour. Um, so you're gonna go read those articles now. Uh, discuss with family and friends. Um, maybe some of them have been in such careers. Do they agree? Do they disagree? Like explore the topic. Understand why people get into commission sales careers and just freaking blow it. 
Okay, that's why would you teach us that stuff, Mike? Because that's the point of this course. Is this for you? And maybe if it's not, you're going to learn a bunch about yourself in the process and you're going to learn why. Okay, uh, then finally, um, well, here, just a bit of a preview for next week. We will start on the work life balance. You will have your 10% mini tests coming up. It's uh, that will likely be done. Usually I put those through the next, the following week, so students have lots of time to take it. You just have a time limit once you go in. Uh, so next week we'll start on the work-life balance uh, and we'll have a 3% guest speaker for credit. The video will be posted and you'll have to do an assignment related to that video. It'll all be explained in FOL as usual. Um, don't forget to look at those articles. And here, this is a cool video that you can watch to wrap up this lecture. Uh, the point of this is we, we started this lecture by talking about a lot of stuff having to do with the skills and the type of things that you might need to have as a professional sales representative. Now, a lot of those techier skills, a lot of that stuff in the digital realm, even 10 years ago, I, I was like at the top of the market in Grand Bend for the, the type of person that might be doing that stuff, even though I waited a few years to kind of infiltrate into Grand Bend. As technology progresses, as, as populations um, uh, flourish in a way that just gives them more access to everything, it, it gets harder and harder to compete. So this video has nothing to do with real estate. It's just one of those videos that's going to make you step back and say, wow, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are looking for a piece of this pie. So I've got to make myself unique. And it, it also might scare the crap out of you. Um, there's some stats in there about how everything you learn in school is going to be irrelevant by the time you graduate. Yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. So it's just one of those videos I like to show, especially in a sales course, just to keep people on their feet. Hey, you know what? You think you know everything? Um, and that's not, did you know? It's, it's, did you know is about these crazy facts that you probably don't know. But if you think you know everything, I guarantee there's somebody else out there that knows more. So you have to be competitive. You have to be on top of your skills. You have to know yourself. You have to understand yourself. You have to understand that in real estate, um, there's lots of different people out there doing it, but most of them are older, so they've had other experience, right? I don't know if you picked up on that in the demographics. Oh, that grid is annoying me there. I'll get that out of there for the next video. So uh, that's it for this lecture video. Thank you very much for watching, um, listening, because it's more like a podcast, as I've been explaining. But uh, you will now be in a position to take your 10% mini test and details on that will be provided in FOL by your professor. I will see you next week.